before we begin, I have to let you all in on a, a secret. It's not really a secret. It's something that the, uh, the National Crime Agency want you all to believe. Um, and it might shock some of you, parents, teachers, you're all affected by this. Your children, every single one of them, is probably a cyber criminal. Now, that's a bold statement, um, but it's something that the UK government think that it's important that parents actually believe. Um, they recently released an ad campaign that highlights that if your child send, spends a large amount of time at their computer, uh, unsociable, they become more unsociable. I mean, you know, we're talking about teenagers here, so they're going to be in their bedrooms at night with the computer on and doing whatever they're doing. Basically, if they're doing those two things, they're probably up to no good. They're probably making money online, hacking into game servers, and trying to break the world. And this has really angered me, and it's why I foolishly put my name down to do a talk today and stand here in front of, uh, in front of everyone. So there's two parts to this and a, and a kind of end that bridges it all together. Now, the first part is the education part. Um, now, I am not a teacher. I am not in education. I'm a, a web developer. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with some really large, fantastic companies. Um, but yeah, I kind of understand how the education works. And I know that back in 2013, the government introduced the uh, computing programming study for Key Stage 1 to 4 teachers to teach, which is a fantastic thing for them to have done. However, I'm not entirely sure that they did it with the right understanding, the right knowledge, and the right mindset to encourage children into web development. So, for example, I put together a little survey prior to this talk where I just asked teachers that are teaching these key stage elements to rate their confidence level, one being not confident at all, five being amazingly confident in core, in the, you know, in the, um, in the core key stage element. This is the outcome of the, uh, of the survey. So, 75% of the teachers that responded at key stage one, where the government has set out the, the core element of learn algorithms, rated their confidence level at two out of five. This is no criticism of the teachers at all. This is purely aimed at the government and their misunderstanding of what they're actually asking teachers to teach. Worse than that, at key stage three, so as the children are getting older, the concept of Boolean, uh, Boolean logic, um, and I won't go into that because it's a very straightforward concept, but if you're not computer-minded or you're not a developer, it can, it can be something that you're not very confident with. 80% of the teachers rated themselves at one out of five for their confidence levels. That's really low, and that's not the teacher's fault. The government aren't investing their time or money in the right area to, to kind of push this thing in, in schools. One in nine schools used their entire IT training budget. One in nine schools. I don't know what the other eight schools were doing with the IT training budget, but it certainly wasn't being spent on teachers going out, speaking to people in the industry, and understanding these concepts that they're being asked to teach. And that this is a problem that we're now seeing. The second part of my talk kind of moves on to the, uh, to the employment side of it. So I started my career as a junior web developer and I've kind of progressed and I've been fortunate enough or unfortunate enough in some circumstances to have to employ developers and interview developers. And there's none out there. There's a real skill sh shortage, a massive skill shortage. And again, this stems back to the government not really understanding that the curriculum needs to change with the times. Web development changes every day. Every single day, web development changes. And what we have in employment is we have two types of people that come to the interviews. You have the earners. These are the ones that work nine till five. They go home, they don't touch a computer. They sit there at their desks, they do exactly what they're told, and they're afraid to learn new things. They're the earners. They're the ones that we don't want to employ. They're really awful. I've had the misfortune of employing some. Thankfully, I think I've employed enough people for them not to know who they are, but I'm sure I'll find out on social media later. Um, <laughs> The other type of person that we do want is the learners. And these are the ones that they get the passion from the people that teach them. Now, when I was at university, I was taught the academic language, which is Java. And within six weeks, I wanted to walk out of university, never turn a computer on, never speak to anyone about programming or anything. It was horrific. And the reason I found it so bad was that for six weeks, I was taught theory, pure theory by I'm going to say it, they're going to kill me. Boring lecturers. They were really boring lecturers. They had no passion for what they were teaching. And then one day, one man walked in, Mark, his name was, not, not me, another Mark. And uh, he was code through and through. He wasn't a geek. We're getting rid of geek. We've, we've had that discussion. We're getting rid of geek. He was passionate about his code. He understood 
everything that he was teaching us, and he understood how to teach development to developing developers. And from that point on, I got over the fact that it was Java, the worst language ever, and it was the principles of programming that excited me. And from that, I kind of went down my own route, and I kind of picked up PHP. And all along throughout university, this lecturer, Mark, was there encouraging me. He was pushing me to, to make mistakes, to fail, to do things wrong, and to learn from it. And this was a, a huge, huge benefit for me. Um, and, uh, you know, he encouraged me into a, a year in industry, which I wasn't really sure about doing, because I just wanted to get out of university and get on with my life, but I also wanted to get the experience from a year in industry. So I went to a, a local company at Bank Plain, and I worked with um, three really amazing people. And I only stayed there for eight weeks, and they actually employed me for the rest of my final year at university, which was fantastic. But even those eight weeks just gave me a passion to get involved in development. So I'm going to show you the video from the National Crime Agency, and, and then we're going to talk about how we can make parents and teachers and people in education that have to teach our developing developers how to bridge the gap. Ollie's such a clever boy. Such a clever boy. <laughs> Custard cream. Spends all night on, on his, his computer. computer. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, how smart is this? You know them shooter games? The other day he was losing, so he crashed the server. Proper whiz kid. It's amazing what kids can do these days. Night, Ollie. Or what do they call it? D-dossing. That's it, I saw it on the telly. And he's no dosser though, are Ollie. A hundred percent in maths. Every single exam for the last two years. Not to mention his GCSE coursework. It's gonna go a long way. Down the M11 to Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> computer sciences degree. Top career in computing. <laughs> Internet billionaire by the time he's 25, the next Steve Gates. <laughs> you know, he's very clever with his money too. He's got more in his account than me. <laughs> Chocolate finger. And we only give him a tenner a week. Told us he robbed a bank. Anyway, that's probably enough of us rambling on. No, not at all. In fact, best if we start again, from the beginning. Oh, he gets 100% in maths. That's one of the key points of this thing. He got 100% in maths. He must be a computer hacker, clearly. Must, there must be something wrong with him to get 100% in maths, because I stand here now, being a developer for 15 years, whatever. I got a D at GCSE Maths. I bloody hated it. I still don't understand maths. As Vicky said earlier, I don't use maths day to day. So him getting 100% in maths just proves that the government have absolutely no idea of the point they're trying to get across to people, because 100% in maths is useless to a developer. It really is. It's completely useless. 100% in development, then he's well on the way. But he didn't get that. And this advert just kind of angers me. But it ends with just the words on the screen saying, help your child make the right choices. So as parents, how do you make your child make the right choices if they want to be a developer? The first thing you do <laughs> is you don't stop them from sitting at their computer till 2 o'clock in the morning doing code or whatever they want to do. Because my parents actively encouraged me to do that, primarily because it probably got me out of their hair, which was fantastic for them. But secondly, my mother was a teacher. And I think she could see that there was something there that I enjoyed doing. They trusted me enough to know that I wasn't hacking banks. And if I was hacking banks, I wouldn't be here now. I'd be in the Bahamas on my own island or something. <laughs> but I'm not. You know, but what I was doing was I was making websites. Now, this was back in 1995, 96, whenever. So I had an hour on the internet, 56K dial-up. I had to cut off after an hour and reconnect because I'd use up the free time. I had to stop between six and seven so my grand could phone. <laughs> and I had to wait a night to listen or to download an MP3 that I could listen to whilst I was doing my program. And this is the, the era that we were in. But my parents actively encouraged me to, to be online, to make websites, to use MSN, to use GeoCities, to use all these different tools that they knew nothing about. But they didn't assume that I was a cyber criminal, which is the, the core thing here. They didn't assume I was a cyber criminal. The next thing that we can do is work closer with the industry. So schools, colleges, universities need to have people from the development industry working with them. Um, having a passion for code and 
spreading that passion to the children in the classroom or the students at university is second to none. You, you, you can't buy that. Um, and this, this is highlighted at a talk I went to uh, last year where a chap called Seb Lee Delisle, you may have heard of him. If you haven't heard of him, watch his, his TED Talks and his YouTube videos. He's amazing. But he did a little presentation, a little live code thing, where he, um, he built these things called particles in HTML and JavaScript. Now I've been doing HTML and JavaScript for years. And when I saw what he was doing, I thought, this is going to be boring. This is going to be really boring. And he walked out on stage, and he was just full of passion and excitement. So much so that after he gave this little demonstration of 20 lines of code at best, and I saw it all on the screen, all these particles pinging around on screen. And, but on the train home, me and the two colleagues I with, like the proper techs we are, sat there with our laptops making particles. And I never thought I'd say that someone, after all these years that I've been doing development, would get me excited about HTML and JavaScript and Canvas and things like that. But he did. He did it because he's passionate, and he knew exactly what to do to show people the right way to do development. And I think that kind of is, is the, the point that I just want to get across, that there are these fantastic initiatives, not just in Norwich, but across the country, where people are setting up things like Sync Developer and the Code Club and Nordev and all these different things that you can just go to. You can send your kids to on a, on a Saturday morning, send them to the Code Club. Just make them go. If they go once and see that what's happening on screen, they'll either get the bug, which is fantastic, and that's what we want, because the, the skill shortage is huge. Or they'll go, no, it's not for me. And that's fine, because they've learned that in the correct environment with the correct people, teaching them the correct kind of the mindset to have for development. Um, and that's something that you can't put a price on. The final thing, because I'm running out of time, is encouraging failure. And I know it's something that we've spoke about uh, previously in talks. You can't put a price on encouraging failure. Um, I actually got mocked a couple of weeks ago from some old colleagues, because they logged on to a live server I was on. And there were a list of backups that I'd taken on the live server, and it was called Mark Backup 1, Mark Backup Backup, Mark Backup of Backup, you know. And they, they mocked me. But that is purely because I have failed, and I am not afraid of failure, but I've learned from it. So there have been times where I have not done a backup of a live database, and I've lost everything. And the time I've had to spend putting that data back in has taught me that failure is not a bad thing, it's an important thing. In fact, it's one of the most important things that we can teach developing developers. So don't be afraid to fail and be brave. And uh, that's it.